Amen. Good singing this morning. All right, the book of Matthew, please, if you would. Chapter number 19. Great to see everyone out uh, today. Isn't this a great time of year? Um, I enjoy it so much. I, I really do, especially when it's above 50 degrees. Okay? If you all understand that. Uh, things have changed a little bit. That happens when you get past the age 49, right? Okay? I, uh, I, I want to touch on an unusual phrase this morning and just reinforce a lot of what we already know, but this really, uh, we might be a little embarrassed to ask, but uh, Peter asked it. Of course, Peter's going to ask anything, right? Okay. Um, notice if you will, I'm going to read a lengthy passage of Scripture today. So you please follow after Matthew uh, chapter number 19. You're going to have um, the story here of, of the rich man that goes away sorrowful. Then we're going to follow that up with Jesus' thoughts about the rich. And then we'll get to uh, an interesting phrase here. Notice if you would please uh, Matthew 19 and we'll put in there at verse 16. And behold... One came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto me, Now notice this, by the way, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. What he is saying here is, number one, I'm going to tell you a lot of things that we're going to talk about that you're doing, but the big thing is you need to understand who I am. Amen. That there is what he's trying to say to the man. But now notice, but if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He said unto him, uh, which, and Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the young man saith unto him, all these have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? And Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect or mature, go and sell that thou hast and give it to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, don't miss that. Um, the idea here, by the way, the Lord doesn't call all of us to do this. But the whole idea here is, even if he would have been following the Lord, if his heart wouldn't have been adjusted, possessions were always first with him. Okay? Then, verse 23, Jesus said unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly, or if you would with difficulty, enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say unto you, it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, and here's where we start to pay close attention. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? And Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. Would you read the next phrase with me out loud? What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration... Basically, that's the new birth. When the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of His glory, ye also sit about twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first." 
I want to preach to us today <coughs> a message that I've entitled a Reward and Expectation. A Reward and Expectation. You'll notice the phrase, What shall we have therefore? Um, it's interesting for, for those of you who would follow commentators, you know what a commentary is, and watch men respond to this. Uh, oh my, uh, the difference response, the, what, what, what men believe this are saying is, is so amazing. Um, a lot of their response, and honestly I really, I really differ with. Uh, most of the response is, this is selfish of Peter. He shouldn't be doing that. We don't serve for reward. And I get what they're saying, but I don't believe that was Peter's heart here at all about this. So let's talk about this just a little bit. The disciples are asking about the future. Now don't be put off by that because there are other times. Do you remember... Uh, Matthew 24, 3, where it says, Tell me then, uh, tell us then, what shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? Lord, we, we, don't, well, we, we don't know. Do you remember in Acts 1, 8, uh, Therefore, when they were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom? Um, what's going to be the sign of your coming here? Are you going to restore the kingdom? What, what are we looking at here as we're serving you when it comes to our future, when it comes to reward? The background of this, if you go back to chapter 16, uh, the Lord is challenging them about service. Notice just for a moment, chapter 16, and go there to verse 24, <clears throat> and it says... Then said Jesus, 1624, unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. So the Lord has already been honing in on trying to draw from them um, a full commitment um, untethered to his cause. That being the case, we're here and, and we're looking at this. And when we're in chapter 19, we, we see the Lord speaking. And I think the disciples are short of shocked. They, see, they saw the rich man and now he's going away sorrowful. And then they saw what the Lord said about any rich person uh, and, and the fact that it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, for them to address spiritual things because their money insulates them in this world. And the disciples begin to take inventory of themselves. Well, what about us? Um, Lord, in light of everything that, we're, that, that, that we've done, um, where are we here with you? And, and uh, what, what are we doing? And what does heaven look like if you would? And I think Peter then, uh, notice this, verse 27, then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we. So he's speaking for the entire group. All right? He has become the spokesman, which tells me this now, right? This has become a point of discussion. They're, they're beginning to discuss about themselves. Well, where are we here? And what are we doing? We certainly believe in the Lord. We're following Him, but... It's like, what? We're, we're, we're leading everybody else and following the Lord. Where are we going? And what is the reward here? And what is heaven like, as it were? All of things are rolling through their mind. And Peter, as the spokesman, wants to hear it, if you would, from the Lord's own lips. What, what is the benefit for the kingdom? And, and we are so prone to be careful about our motives, that very thing, it just runs against the grain a little bit, doesn't it? Uh, to be able to hear him say that. Yet, the Lord does not rebuke him at all. The Lord answers him. So this question is not out of the way. I, 
I think that we could rightly say with some that it would be wrong to make this kind of thing our primary focus. What do we get out of it? Uh, I wouldn't give you two cents for a pastor that's going to a church and he's interviewing for a position when the first question out of his mouth is, what do I get paid? I tell him to leave. By the way, that's good for just common work help, isn't it? Right? Just trying to get a job anywhere. <clears throat> but, I, but I think that, that, doesn't, that isn't our perspective. What we receive from our service for Christ shouldn't be central when the Lord has called us to obey, and our obedience certainly is contingent, though, on how we're going to be rewarded. He's given us all mercy, and we have really given Him nothing, right, when it comes to our salvation. He has done everything. So I don't believe it's wrong here for Peter to be able to express wanting to know what are rewards for faithful service, especially when he decides to tell us in the passage. I understand that we are to walk by faith in every aspect of our Christian life. And there are times when the Lord asks us to step out by faith, asks us to step out, can I say it with us, with blind faith, and simply grab a hold and trust Him, if you would. But here... The Lord is not asking them to embrace their entire Christian experience without an, without an explanation of the game plan. He wants to tell them what that is. And there, so throughout the Word of God, we find that just like He tells the disciples that they're going to have an opportunity to judge the 12 tribes. He scatters throughout the New Testament things that we understand that are rewards for us in our faithful service. As a matter of fact, there are crowns that we can win as, as believers. Well, now, if we weren't supposed to be interested in that thing, why would the Lord have told us that? We ask the question here, he asks, what shall we have therefore? And uh, I, I, as I look at that, and we're looking at them. I, I want to see what they were doing here. Does that make sense? Well, what is their heart here? What is the background? So, a couple of things uh, today. Number one, uh, they had followed him completely. Completely. They had followed him completely. I want you to notice verse 27 again. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. And that, that was heartfelt. It says, listen here, number one, we have forsaken all. In contrast to the rich young ruler. And you know what? What he's saying there is, we have surrendered on your terms. Um, I'm not going to pick on them. Nor do I mean to elevate them in this situation, but I'm conscious of the fact that Jaron's parents are here. And they're, and they're serving, and they're serving on the mission field. They could have done a lot of other things with their lives. Right? Okay. And, 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 and what, what Peter is saying is, this is what we've done. Um, we, we have went ahead and given you everything. Now let me stop and prep and say that God... For your surrender is not saying, be a pastor, go to the mission field, or you have to go and sell all that you have. But what we're going to see through the passage is, you have got to be willing, if you would, to be able to take everything and say, Lord, here that is. Everything must be His. Because whatever is not His, that's yours, will certainly lead us astray in this life. Okay, so he's saying in this context, because they have been called, he says, listen, we have forsaken all. We have left our livelihoods. 
Uh, we, we're no longer fishermen there. We've left our families in the sense that they have to stay at home while we're out and as a tenor missionary, uh, ministry rather. We have different goals. We've left our friends, our purposes. Um, and, and he said, because a true believer show a surrender of all of their lives to the Lord. So wherever you're serving, whether it's the, whether it's the mission field, or you're serving as a carpenter, or a plumber, or you're mowing grass, or you're working in the office, or you have the great responsibility of being at home, and working as a homemaker, whatever it is, are you in the will of God? And there, while you're in the will of God, have you given Him everything? <clears throat> Next it says, not only have we forsaken all, but it says, we have followed thee. Do you notice that? What's interesting is, there in your Bible, look down at verse number 21. Can, can, can you do that? Verse number 21, Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. Verse 27, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all, and followed thee. Down to verse 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me. He said, Listen, we have followed you. We're not following tradition. Um, we've not risked everything. We've invested everything to follow you. The word follow means to do it in the fullest sense. They're not making sacrifices here. They believe they were making investments. And the thing about investments is all the dividends you don't receive now in this life. The majority of them are in the next life. Amen. Amen. And notice the two words. Let me read verse 27 again. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. The word all, we have left all, and that is, a, that is a, a decisional sacrifice I have chosen to make. I have chosen to make. I, I, I remember clear as yesterday, um, back in 1979, I'm amazed I can remember anything clear as yesterday. There are only a few things like that. Sitting in a gathering of family around Christmas and announcing them that Donna and I would be moving to Greenville, South Carolina because God had called me. By the time I was done sharing that, every person had got up and walked out of the room in disgust, except for one. It was like, boy, what did you do here? You're in it now. Dave Young, I don't know if you saw it, Evangelist David Young has announced that he's taking a pastorate. And I texted him and I said, congratulations. <laughs> and I jokingly said, boy, what did you do? You sure got into it now. He texted me back, he said, that's, that's the best text I've got. I almost spit my coffee across the room. <laughs> I was joking with my son Paul, and I said, give him a year. He's going to go, hmm, this is a little different, isn't it? <laughs> Notice, he says, uh, not only have we forsaken all, we have followed thee. Not followed just anyone. Here's the key. We have followed thee. Not the church schedule. We had followed thee. Not others or not institutions. Not even mom and dad. We have followed thee. That makes the difference. It's an ideal following. Can I put it that way? And by the way, this ideal following of finding Christ, what? It has to be something that has to be revisited on a regular basis. You see, you can get to the place when you're following Him that you can get bitter in service. 
You start looking around at others and what they have or what God's calling upon their life is. Don't measure yourself by other people. You have one life. Don't stop three quarters of the way in your service for the Lord. Don't be envious of the success of others. They said, we have found Christ. He's the treasure that we're looking for. Ultimately, all is his, and ultimately, we want to be his. You see, you free yourself from the envy of, of, of possessions and have to have when everything that comes that you would account as it were, as that that would bring you wealth, that which would enlarge you when you understand, when you calculate it all up and you write on the bottom of it, this is his. It really helps. If you can imagine the family in Lebanon during the recent war, you picture the dad who has worked and worked to try to, to put together some kind of, of cement housing for his family and purchase their first home. And mom's at home, she's not working, but the two sons are, and father and two sons are working together. And finally they gather enough funds up to be able to get that cement block structure they can call their own, and they come back uh, <clears throat> after all the family is separated and things have been blown to smithereens as it were, they come back and find out that most of their house doesn't even exist because it's been blown apart, but they rejoice because they find that each one of them is alive Amen. and the fact that that's really home. Let's understand that Sooner or later, you have to make a decision between stuff and relationships. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Number two, they're asking pertinent questions here. I think, I think underneath that, number one, there's a confusion, if you would, if I can put it that way, uh, over discipleship. You see, <clears throat> they're listening to the Lord and they're, they're seeing a man that's coming that wants to follow the Lord. The Lord actually asks, get rid of this and come and follow me, be my disciple. And the man rejects that call. In, in other words, understand what he's doing here. I'm not going to be with the twelve. I'm not, I'm not going to be like that. I'm not going to be with the Lord. He walked away sorrowful because I can't let this stuff go. The disciples just saw that and they're trying to work through that now in their hearts and their minds as they realize what they have. They also realize that with all the disciples, they were on different social ladders as, as, as they were giving themselves to the Lord, just like we are here and, and, and there's confusion, if you would. They saw the rich man that he was not willing to surrender. Then they hear the Lord, and they're just stunned by this. It says how difficult it is, you know, how can a rich man hardly or with difficulty enter the kingdom of God? Notice verse 25 again. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed saying then, who can be saved? Why were they doing that? Because in their mindset, God had already blessed that man. In their mindset, if he has wealth and he has riches, and there's nothing wrong with that, but if that's what he has, doesn't that show God's blessing upon him? And the Lord is saying, no, it doesn't. And so, in that culture, that's what they were taught and so there's confusion over discipleship as they see what's happening to the rich man. They hear what the Lord is saying right here. And all of this now begins to bubble up and they're starting to have private conversations in groups of two or three as the disciples. And it's coming up and coming up and coming up. And the question is, what are we going to have if we've given you everything? Can I say to you that it's all right to be asked some questions as you're serving the Lord. 
He doesn't ask you to walk blindly. That doesn't mean that he's going to show you everything, right? Okay. Uh, that 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 uh, don't don't expect that. Uh, but I do know this, and so do you. If you know Christ, I have I have a mansion somewhere in the New Jerusalem. I don't know. I don't know if it's on Hallelujah Street or Be Thou My Vision Avenue, but it's there somewhere. <laughs> Notice this. They want to be faithful, but they are also asking, "What happens to us?" Jesus is not dissatisfied. By the way, can I say this? I don't believe God struggles with us wanting to know certain truths about heaven and assurances, and there are some of those that He gives to us. Not all of them, but some of them that He does. Is it worth what we're doing for the Lord Jesus? Now that might not sound very spiritual, but it's here in the passage, can I say to this, that reward is a motivation. Don't tell me I sound like Benny Hinn, just quit, okay? <laughs> reward is a motivation. Why is it? Because he's going to talk about everlasting life. Isn't heaven a reward? Isn't that a motivation? Now, I can never lift the motivation to first place. My motivation is, look what Jesus has done for me. Amen. But it's all right to understand what that we're not simply um, wasting our time unless... You're here and you know Christ as Savior and you have to bow your head today because you haven't been living for Him at all. What do I do, Pastor? Understand that you're here today because this is your chance to change everything because there is not one stain on the page of Monday for you. Amen. Notice it. <clears throat> Matter of fact, Keep your finger there and turn back to Matthew 6. And let's go to verse 3. You have it, Matthew 6, 3? But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, uh, that thine alms may be in secret, and the Father which seeth, in, which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Yeah, it's there. It's in the Scripture. Consideration, notice it if you would, please, number two, of riches. A couple of things. We think about riches. Riches can encourage from this passage a false independence. Riches can encourage a false independence. Riches brings an independence that you think that you have, but that is a false narrative if you're not basing your life upon the rock. That's right. And when the storm comes, you will be washed away. Amen. Next, Riches shackle people to this earth. Isn't it nice to have nice things? I think it's nice to have nice things. But some of you are different scales of nice things. The, the, some of you, it's nice to have nice things. I have a brand new coffee pot. Okay? Some of you nice things, I have a brand new car, I have a, a brand new home, right? Those nice, I don't know where the basis of nice things are, but it is nice to be able to have those things as believers. And by the way, what I've noticed is the majority of time over the years after being here a long time, I notice as people come in, trust Christ and grow, God adds to them things, earthly things. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, remember this. Remember this uh, about your riches. Okay? 
you got to decide where you are. Some people get, keep. Other people get, keep, pass on. You got to decide where you're going to be there. Okay, with what God has given you. God's entrusted you these things for a reason. Don't let yourself be shackled to this earth and the people of this earth because of riches. Riches tend to make people selfish. <clears throat> you would think the opposite, but it's not that way. Riches tend to make people selfish. Riches tend to allow us to, to be able to pass judgments and we begin to group people. And we begin to live in this group rather than that group. Let me just move on here, if I might. Um, lastly, those who put Christ first. Now I'm going to read these verses again, and then we're just going to sort of boil it down and just share a couple of things. Verse 28, And Jesus said unto them, Very I say unto you that ye which have followed me. There, there it is. That's a principle, no matter who we are. We have followed me in the regeneration. I believe that basically boils down to our salvation when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of His glory. For the disciples now, ye shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's going to happen. That's part of their reward. And everyone, oh, what would I say? Everyone, everyone. And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or fathers, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, or for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. Verily I say unto you, in other words, truly, truly, I want you to get this, I want you to understand this. Number one, those who share in the campaign will share in the victory. Those who share in the campaign will share in the victory. Are you sharing in the campaign? Are you here? Are you involved? Are you trying to live for the Lord Jesus? Are you involved? Are you sideline sitting? Dr. General Douglas MacArthur in a speech before Congress, 1951, part of his speech was this, old soldiers never die, they just fade away. And like the old soldier of that ballad, I now close my military career and just fade away. An old soldier who tried to do his duty as God gave him the light to see that duty, goodbye. Do you know in a lot of warfare, a lot of things that are won as it were for us fallen soldiers, etc., the vast, vast, vast majority of them are never remembered. And in local churches like this all over the world, there are those that are behind the scenes holding the ropes, being faithful, and you wonder maybe, is this worth this? What are other people doing? What have I gotten myself into? Okay, should I continue being faithful? Can I, can I just say to you that the difference between your service and that of an earthly soldier is that the Lord ever, ever remains faithful. He never forgets. And when you share in the campaign of living for Christ, it will never be forgotten and you will be rewarded, 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 just like they were. Those who share in the campaign will share the victory. Okay? It's going to happen. <clears throat> I know how it is. We're, we're serving the Lord and we're serving the Lord and every once in a while, this is uh, what we do. We start looking around. Right? And it's like, you know, those people attend, 
but I never see them doing much of anything. Why is it that 20% of the people seem to be doing 80% of the work? And that can become discouraging. By the way, that's why you ought to be involved somewhere. If your name, you're a member of Emmanuel Baptist Church, you ought to be involved somewhere doing something. Um, I have somebody that I don't have to ask for this to be done, but every day I have a ginger ale and ice water up here. Somebody does that. Okay. And that's under the Lord. And if you know my, my past with my throat, I need it. Okay, so if you see me drinking something clear up here, don't wonder. (laughs) You think that hasn't run across somebody's mind? Huh? This is a church. We're Baptist people. Okay. A follower of the Lord Jesus may be called to give up comforts and security of houses and homes. But in the family of the kingdom of God, what I found is there's comfort and security in countless of homes almost anywhere. There are other brothers and sisters that we gain that we've never had before that sometimes become closer than the brothers and sisters we actually have by blood. But we want them in too, amen? Amen. All of them. The Bible tells us about the early Christians, but they had all things common. Many of them had to leave, were persecuted, brothers and sisters, and yet they found countless support at so many places. The Lord tells us to cast our bread upon the waters, and one day it will return to us. And that's, that's, that's so very, very true. It, it really is. Um, for a moment, keep your finger here and turn to Mark 10. <clears throat> Mark 10, we'll be right back here. <coughs> Mark 10. And let's go to verse 28. Mark 10 and 28. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that have houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the Gospels, that he shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brethren and sisters and brethren and children and lands. Notice the next verse, with persecutions. And in the world to come, eternal life. Those who live for his name's sake will be rewarded in this time. Now, if the Lord cuts somebody's life short, they might not see the reward. But I find again, as I, as I pass through a group of people over a series of years, it's amazing the relationships that God establishes and reestablishes and the things that God gives to His people. Now some people are such a mindset where the Lord has put them is everything God gives, they just give away. Because that's where God has them. That's where they want to be. That's what they're doing with their life, etc. Good. You allow them to do what God wants them to do, and you just do what God wants you to do. But I, but I'm, but I'm burdened about this. I, I think we do a pretty good job, but we could probably do a better one. Um, if there are brothers and sisters that are in need, where are you? You ought to be there. You should be there. I'm glad the church has resources, but just don't count on the church. Are you there? There's nothing greater than being able to help others without them realizing who did it. Isn't that fun? I, 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 I really. 
We, 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 we should enjoy that. Um, when we become Christians, we enter into a new divine fellowship. So I not only have new relationships, but I have a new relationship with him. And that new relationship with him affects and spars other relationships. I can, I can uh, be at an airport, sitting in an airport, my wife and I waiting for the plane, and you bump into someone within a minute, you probably know they're a believer. And you, isn't that an amazing instant fellowship, uh, relationship that can come just like that? that God gives us. He gives us those things along the way. Thirdly, when we live our lives, uh, when we live it all up, when we're all done, there are going to be surprises in the final assessment. What do you mean? Notice verse, um, if, verse 30. And many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. In this context, the Lord seems to be laying down that there are going to be surprises in the final assessment in heaven. God's standard of judgment are not human standards. God sees the heart of every one of us. He has a right in, in, in the atmosphere of heaven to rebalance everything, and he will in a just manner. In eternity, he will adjust all the misjudgments of time. In eternity, that which is lifted up will be humbled. In eternity, the first could be last, and the last could be first. Here is where we walk by faith, and we do our best, and we give our lives to the Lord. I, 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 want, I want to just finish by saying it's all right for you to understand I'm working towards something. That's not the reason I'm doing it. But the fact is I am working towards something. There is a heavenly retirement. God has promised to bring provision to his people. And that's okay. Amen. That's okay. There are questions, other questions in this life. There are the questions of whys. And they don't don't, don't be one of those that tell me, Pastor, you should never ask why. If you believe that, God bless you. I, I mean that. But don't just bring that to me. Take that to Luke. Don't bring that to me. Okay? Um, been there, done that. All right? You know, the Lord says that from the cross. Why? Okay. It's all right to ask questions in this life. Now, it's not all right to have your own conclusions and your own answers. Amen. And you become, become envious and bitter off of those things. And there are some answers, that are questions that we ask that we're not going to get answers for. I can give you a list now. I don't have answers for. But you know, a lot of things we do have answers for. Okay. So we bring that all here, and I want to say to you that the greatest thing that he says that he will give unto them is everlasting life, eternal life. The Bible tells us that we can know that we have eternal life. You know that. The Bible uses that word, K-N-O-W. We can know. If you're here, you can know that. <clears throat> okay? That has nothing to do with uh, being a Baptist or a Methodist or a Catholic. No, no, no. That has to do with you knowing what your relationship with Christ is. And the Bible says you can know that. So my question is today as we finish this time, do you know that? Are you here? Do you have that settled? Do you have a question about it? That's something you can get settled. I, I hope an unusual passage that it's been helpful to refresh that to our hearts today. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are. God, I just ask that you'd move in our hearts and lives today. And Lord...
that you would be real to every person here. Lord, I know there are people here that serve selflessly. And I pray, dear God, today that you would comfort them and lift them up and they would understand who you are and what you are and what you have promised to each one of us. But with heads bowed and eyes closed, would you be here today and you say, Pastor Robert, I am not sure about my salvation. I am not sure that I would go to heaven. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'd just like to remember you in a word of prayer, just between me and you. I won't call out your name. I wouldn't do anything like that. But I'd just like to remember you to the Lord. If you say, Pastor, I'm here. I don't know. I don't know about my salvation. I just don't. And would you just remember me in a word of prayer? Would you just slip your hand up that I could do that right around the room? Yes, God bless you. Yes, God bless you. Others today. Lord, thank you for the hands that were raised. And I pray that you would minister to those dear people. Now, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you raised your hand or you didn't, let me just set forth these truths today. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you're here, do you understand that you're a sinner before a holy God? Say, Pastor, I understand that. The, Bi the Bible says that Jesus, the just for the unjust, died that he might bring us to God. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you realize that Jesus Christ died for you? The Bible tells us that he rose again from the dead. So my question is, follow me, do you believe you're a sinner? Yes, I do. Do you believe Christ died for you and he rose again from the dead? Say, Pastor, I believe that. I do. Then the Bible says this, Whosoever shall call, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Lord says, if you see your sinful condition, if you believe I died for you, would you come and ask me for my salvation? Would you ask me to give you my righteousness? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you believe that? If you do, then would you call upon him right now? If you're here and you want to be saved from your heart of hearts, would you just follow me in prayer and would you just ask the Lord this? Would you ask him this? Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. Lord, I believe you died for me, that you rose again from the dead. Come into my heart. Come into my life, Lord. Lord, would you save me? Lord, would you have mercy upon me? Lord, would you forgive me? Heavenly Father, would you take me to heaven when I die? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you prayed that from your heart of hearts, would you just lift your hand? Preacher, I meant that. I prayed that. Yes, yes, yes. God bless you. Thank you so much. Lord, you've seen the hands and the hearts, and you please have your way now today. In your precious name, amen. All right, if the men would come, please, this morning.